Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part four. And this is the final part of CT evaluation of liver masses, key differential diagnosis pathways. And I left off last time making the point that hepatoma and vascular metastasis to the liver can look very, very similar. Obviously, the presence of cirrhosis makes it more likely hepatoma than metastasis, but it can be challenging in tumors that are especially challenging, thyroid cancer, renal cell, and neuroendocrine. But it's not only those. Here's a patient with elevated liver function tests. Large hepatic mass, impressive neovascularity, right? Pseudocapsule, look at the neovascularity seen on the MIP imaging. I'm thinking hepatoma all the way. There it is on the uh, MIP in a coronal presentation, beautifully shown the neovascularity, the central tumor necrosis. There it is on the venous phase, that pseudocapsule the quick washout of the lesion. This was biopsied. It was leiomyosarcoma metastatic to the liver, looking identical to a hepatoma. Or this case, big liver mass hypervascular, too bright for hemangioma. It's not an FNH. It's not a adenoma. This is hepatoma, except for the fact this patient ends up with thyroid cancer. And this very vascular lesion in this non-serotic liver which washes out fairly quickly on venous phase imaging, is metastatic thyroid cancer to the liver. So again, biopsy will be necessary at times. Clinical history, the knowledge the patient has a thyroid cancer or a neuroendocrine tumor, all indeed are going to be very helpful. But again, the overlap with the patients with hepatoma. Now, there are other tumors we need to think about that we see occasionally. Primary hepatic lymphoma is a rare primary liver tumor due to its clinical and radiologic resemblance to liver mets from adenocarcinoma. It's frequently diagnosed intra or postoperatively. Since chemo is the treatment of choice for lymphoma, adjuvant chemotherapy should be given for optimal treatment. Now, again, it's a difficult diagnosis. We talk about the same thing at times with adrenal lymphoma. We talk about the same thing at times with renal lymphoma, how it simulates the more common lesions. Now, of course, it's easy when you have lymphoma and then you have splenic or liver or renal involvement or all of them because then you know what you're dealing with, but it's when it's only in the liver that's especially challenging. Some examples, elevated LFTs, there's an infiltrating process in the liver is it tumor? Is it inflammatory? There are some notes, I guess, near the porta hepatis. Look at it on the venous phase imaging. There's diffuse infiltration of the liver. You could go for a lot of things. It's not the look of hepatoma. Is it infectious or inflammatory? What's going on? This was a case on biopsy of B-cell lymphoma. So B-cell lymphoma especially can be infiltrative. There are nodes by the celiac axis, but this infiltrating process very much simulating parenchymal liver disease, simulating cirrhotic liver disease can be a real challenge. Another patient, multiple lesions in the liver and spleen, as well as some nodes, that's gonna make it a little bit easier. When I see liver and spleen, you gotta think about sarcoid. So sarcoid can really confuse you. It can look just like lymphoma, and sometimes it's called lymphoma. Um, Again, very nicely, you can have METs also to liver and to spleen. But when I see liver and splenic lesions, I'm always thinking about sarcoid, okay? I'm thinking about lymphoma, and I'm thinking about metastatic melanoma. And this was a nice example of B-cell lymphoma as well, very nicely shown. You can see the lesions are in the one to two centimeter range. And here it is very nicely shown on the cinematic rendering as well. Again, Think about that differential diagnosis. Another example, there's something infiltrating once again in the liver. The vessels seem to be stretched. The spleen looks okay. But interestingly, look how much more obvious it is on the venous phase imaging. Hepatoma usually is seen well on both arterial and venous phase imaging. METs, depending how vascular they are, maybe seen better arterial or better venous or the same. Lymphoma is an interesting case, and it's true in multiple organs. Lymphoma tends to be an infiltrating process. And so look how obvious the multiple hepatic lesions are. Now, if I only had the venous phase, I would think about metastasis, but you gotta be thinking about lymphoma as well. 
And just a really nice example showing you the multifocal disease, also nicely shown on the coronal images as well. Another patient, liver mass, diffuse infiltration of the liver, there's something extra hepatic, there are large nodes in the periodic region, the spleen is top normal but no focal splenic lesions, there's ascites present. Again, what are you thinking about? Cirrhosis, a mass in the liver in a cirrhotic patient, hepatoma, could it be cholangiocarcinoma? The nodes, the pericardiac nodes, the periodic nodes, got to be thinking when I see lots of nodes about lymphoma, hepatoma, cholangios, they have nodes sometimes, but they're central in the hilum, not above the diaphragm and not in the periodic region. This was a really unusual, but a great example of lymphoma involving the liver. Okay. And it was considered primary lymphoma with adenopathy on pathology. Really nice case. Another patient, jaundice, multiple hepatic lesions, but what you see mainly is this infiltration centrally in the hilum of the liver. You can see stretching of the arterial structures, obstruction of the common duct. You're saying, could this be pancreas? No, it's not pancreas. Could this be liver? If it's liver, a hepatoma usually doesn't obstruct the ducts. Then I'm thinking about an infiltrating cholangiocarcinoma. Could it be something growing into the liver? Um, is that a possibility, like something arising from the ampulla, then growing upward? That's a thought. Well, nicely shown the infiltration of the volume rendering and MIP imaging as well. And as you go to venous phase imaging, the mass borders are a bit more obvious. The dilated duct's impressive. So now you're thinking mass centrally infiltrating dilated ducts, maybe some nodes. What am I dealing with? Venous phase, the encasement and narrowing of the portal vein. This was lymphoma. Okay, again, central infiltrating. You got to think about lymphoma, though I will admit cholangio would have been the first thing I thought about. So you can see there's a spectrum of lesions with lymphoma. You can have dilated ducts, you can have nodes, you can have central nodes, you can have a, a splenic involvement all things that give you the spectrum. And in this case, a beautiful example of lymphoma infiltrating the hilum of the liver. Now I said at the beginning in part one, I was gonna speak about tumors and benign lesions, just masses in general, benign and malignant. But I also said I would put in a little bit about abscesses, which I'll speak about separately in a longer talk, just to make the point that hepatic abscesses can really simulate processes like tumor. We talk about abscesses from pyogenic to amoebic to parasites, fungal, granulomas disease, and other uh, etiologies. Here's a good example of a patient was found down. Patient had weight loss, but again, not a reliable patient. There's a large mass in the liver, and I looked at it. It's cystic, and the patient really wasn't febrile to my knowledge. We weren't working up an abscess. We were working up failure to thrive, and I thought this was a tumor, maybe a hepatoma, maybe a big met. This was an abscess. This was an E. coli abscess. So abscesses can be very large and they can simulate primary hepatic tumors. Pyogenic abscesses, commonly from hematogenous spreads from the GI tract. You get ascending cholangitis or superinfection of necrotic tissue. E. coli, like the last case, is the most common agent. And clinical presentation is variable. Fever, right-sided abdominal pain, even weight loss and elevated LFT. So you can see when the patient's not a good historian and you have no history, why infection and malignancy can look very similar. Another case, this looks like that infiltrating tumor I showed you before. One case I showed you infiltrating was hepatoma. One case I showed you infiltrating was hepatic adenoma. There's a little bit of air bubbles present as well. Air bubbles, you can say, was there a biopsy? Was there ascending cholangitis? Is it developing into an abscess? This was a large infiltrating hepatic abscess. Again, when you look at it, you're thinking more about tumor than abscess. Shows better on the venous face. Looks very much like the case I showed you a few moments ago in the right lobe, and the patient was found down. But you can see these abscesses often will be unilateral. It'll be single but huge, and they're kind of infiltrating kind of very much, again, simulating a tumor. And here it is again with the peripheral enhancement. 
This case is an FUO. Perhaps there it's easier cystic lesion right lobe. Yes, you could have cystic mets. You can have hepatoma. But the way the wall enhances, this one's a bit easier. This looks like an abscess. Right lobe of the liver, a cystic lesion. I'm always going to go, particularly with this thickened rim that you see very nicely here, with an amoebic abscess. So a really good example of an amoebic liver abscess, but also a good example showing you, again, sometimes it's not that easy to separate abscess from tumor, and sometimes combining the clinical history and the CT appearance, you're going to do a lot better. In this case, the patient had fever. This is an unusual multifocal lesion. They're kind of near each other, a cystic, fairly well-defined. The liver is not cirrhotic. What could this be? Could it be infarcts? That's not a bad thing to think about. This was eventually biopsied, and this was hydatid disease. Remember, I mentioned before hydatid disease, the majority have septations, daughter cysts, and 80% have rim-like calcifications. This had none of the findings. So abscesses, even hydatid, which quote-unquote look classic, may not look classic. Now, in the patient who has had surgery, abscess is always something to think about. One thing that overlaps with abscess in this patient post-Whipple's procedure would be infarction. When you have significant surgery with vessel resection, infarcts are a bit better defined, sharper marginated than abscesses. Infarcts can lead to abscesses. Air within the lesion can be due to surgery, but again, infarcts or abscesses can have air within them. And in the same patient, you could see there were other lesions. Sometimes infarcts are easier to diagnose on the venous phase imaging because they typically have sharper borders than abscesses. Abscesses can be rounder, more irregular. Infarcts tend to be more geographic and wedge-shaped. And this was multiple infarcts in a patient post of Whipple's procedure. Okay, just a really nice case and something to think about. Another patient with right upper quadrant pain. Now, I always like to leave you with the feeling that if you follow all of the rules, you're going to get everything right all the time. But this case maybe makes it difficult. There's this complex cystic lesion dome of liver in a patient with right upper quadrant pain. Patient had no known malignancy, and so you say, oh my goodness, there's a mass here. Could this be a hepatoma? Could this be a cholangial carcinoma? Could it be metastasis? Could it be an abscess? It's a solid mass with cystic components. What exactly is this? Patient's history wasn't great for an abscess. Patient had had no foreign travel. Patient had had no procedures done recently. No history of any hospitalizations or medication. This was eventually resected and was an inflammatory pseudotumor of the liver. Now, I have a couple inflammatory pseudotumors of the liver, and the reason I know that's what it is is because the pathologist told me. Inflammatory pseudotumors of the liver are an uncommon benign tumor-like lesion that sometimes mimics a malignant tumor, particularly METS or cholangio. In the majority of cases, these inflammatory pseudotumors are most likely inflammatory or infectious in origin. The lesions often appear to develop from a healing abscess or an inflammatory condition resulting from rupture of the bile duct or extravasation of bile into the tissue. It's really an unusual condition. And just to make the point that sometimes, even when you follow all of the rules, you're not going to be right. So we've looked at four sections looking at tumors focusing on cysts and cystic-like lesions, hemangiomas, focusing on FNH and its appearance, focusing on hepatic adenoma and its appearance, and then looking at hepatoma and some of the things like metastasis that can simulate hepatoma. There's a lot more we can go through, but let me just do some summary statements. As we started Lesion detection alone is not enough. We need to be more specific, recognizing we're not always going to be further evaluation with biopsy or MRI may be necessary. Having a long differential diagnosis list is not going to be helpful for the referring doc. We don't want to be superheroes and give one thing if we don't know what it is. And I think it's important for us to say we're uncertain. Like those cases I showed you of spontaneous bleed, it was hard to tell which ones were hepatoma and which was simply hepatic adenoma. Creating a differential diagnosis is important and also helping the patient's referring doc with management decisions. 
Now, in order to do this correctly, you need proper scan protocols, understanding the important role of multi-phase acquisition, understanding the important role of post-processing. I showed you a lot of important information that was garnered from using MIP imaging and garnered from using cinematic rendering. Just looking at axial images is not always going to be helpful. Remember the signature appearances of the various tumors. Remember that the signatures may not always be there. There's a lot of exceptions to the rules. And clinical history can be helpful, but is not always going to be helpful. And with that, I thank you for your attention and have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.